Welcome back to the Cisco NetAcad CCNA Switching, Routing and Wireless Essentials lecture series. If you haven't seen my previous lectures, I will leave a link in the description for the playlist. I would also recommend that you watch the Introduction to Networks lecture series before you move forward with this course. Today, I will cover module number 12, which is WLAN concepts. The primary objective of this module is to explain how wireless LAN enable network connectivity. We will introduce you to the wireless technologies. We will learn about the components of WLAN, WLAN operation, CAPWAP operation, channel management, WLAN threats, and finally we will learn how you can secure those wireless systems. Introduction to wireless. So what are the benefits of wireless technologies? A wireless LAN, also known as WLAN, is a type of wireless network that is commonly used in homes, offices, and campus environments. WLANs make mobility possible within the home and business environments because you don't have any cables connected to your device that is connected to your WLAN network. Wireless infrastructure adapt to rapidly changing needs and technologies. So as the technology progressed, we have developed better technologies for WLAN deployment. There are a few types of wireless technologies or wireless network technologies. They include WPAN, WLAN, WMAN, and WWAN. WPAN, which is the Wireless Personal Area Network, is a low power and short range, about 20 to 30 feet or 6 to 9 meters uh, network. And it is based on the IEEE 802.15 standard and it is used uh, with the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Your Bluetooth devices, for example, is using WPAN technology. So if you have a cell phone or if you have uh, a wireless uh, Bluetooth uh, speakers, for example, that you connect, that would be using the IEEE 802.15 standard, which is a part of WPAN technologies. Another example would be the ZigBee. So they are also using uh, for, uh, you know, uh, in the home automation systems and they use the WPAN standards. Wireless LAN, also known as WLAN, is a medium-sized network up to 300 feet based on IEEE 802.11 standard and it uses 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency. This is the one that we are mostly familiar with because WLAN technology is what we see in our homes, small businesses and offices where we connect to our Wi-Fi networks. Wireless MAN, also known as WMAN, is a large geographic area such as city or district networks and it uses specific license frequencies. Wireless WAN or WAN is an extensive geographic area for national or global communication systems and it also uses specific license frequencies within that geographic area. So if you dive into the wireless technologies, uh, the first thing we're gonna look at is the Bluetooth. So the Bluetooth use the uh, IEEE WPAN standard, which is used for pairing devices up to 300 feet or 100 meter in distance. Bluetooth e low energy or BLE supports mesh topology to large scale networks. So blue, Bluetooth uh, low energy systems, also known as BLEs, that can support the mesh systems. Bluetooth basic rate, enhanced rate, also known as BREDR, support point-to-point -point topologies and is optimized for audio streaming. YBAX, which is stands for Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access, is an alternate broadband wired ether internet connections. So it is an alternate to uh, broadband wired Ethernet connections. They are called WiMAX. 
and it is defined by the IEEE 802.16 W LAN uh, standard for up to 30 miles or 50 kilometers. So the Bluetooth is short range and it is used typically to connect devices uh, like personal devices and but also can be used for point-to-point -point topologies. WiMAX is a worldwide interoperability for microwave access. That's why it stands for WiMAX. And that can be used uh, for connecting up to 30 miles or 50 uh, kilometers apart systems. So that, for example, the Bluetooth here uh, shown on the picture here by Cisco is showing a like a Bluetooth um, headphone device, like a earbud. But uh, the WiMAX is like a huge antennas like this and that can communicate up to like 30 miles or 50 kilometers uh, between the antennas. So that's what we have on here. And next we're gonna look at the cellular broadband, which can carry both voice and data and used by phones, automobiles, tablets, and laptops. And global system of mobile, also known as GSM, uh, is an internationally recognized system. Then we also have code division multiple access, also known as CDMA, which is mostly used in the US, but also in some parts of Asia as well. And uh, satellite broadband, uh, which is a, a, a another technology of wireless, uh, that uses directional satellite dish aligned with satellites in geostationary orbit. It needs clear line of sight and typically used in rural locations where cable and DSL are unavailable. So satellite, I would say the upfront cost is a little bit higher as well. So it is not widely used mostly in uh, you know uh, the metropolitan areas, but in rural areas where there are maybe no um, cable internet or DSL lines available, satellite may be a good option for those uh, wireless internet systems. 802.11 standards. 802.11 WLAN standard defines how radio frequencies are used for wireless links. Remember 802.11 standard is a IEEE international standard. So in this table, it defined what are the different variation of that 802.11 standard. This is a really good diagram or in the table that you should remember for your exams. This may show up on your Cisco net exams, CCNA and CCNP exams. So make sure you understand this table. Uh, at least if you don't understand it, just memorize it so that you know how this works. So 802.11 standard is a 2.4 gigahertz standard and it support data rate up to two megabytes per second. Then we have 802.11a, which is an improvement to the 802.11 standard, but at the five gigahertz level. So it support data rates up to 54 megabytes per second and not interoperable with the 802.11b or 802.11g standards. And then we have 802.11b standard, which supports the radio frequency of 2.4 gigahertz and support data up to 11 megabytes per second. And it is used for longer range than 802.11a and better able to penetrate building structures. So if you have walls, for example, this is better than the 802.11a standard. 802.11g standard, uh, is in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency and support data rates up to 54 megabyte per second and it is backward compatible with 802.11b standard. 802.11n standard which is the most popular standard nowadays in homes and offices support both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands and it support data rate between 150 to 600 megabyte per second and it requires multiple antennas with uh, MIMO technology or MIMO technology. 802.11ac standard, which is a five gigahertz band that is also getting, becoming popular uh, for home users nowadays, uh, support data rates up to 450 megabyte per second, all the way to 1.3 gigabyte per second, and supports up to eight antennas. 802.11ax standard, which operates on 2.4 and five gigahertz, 
supports high efficiency wireless HEW and capable of using one gigahertz and seven gigahertz frequencies uh, as well. So for your exams and quizzes, you should know what these standards are and what radio frequencies these standards are associated with. I haven't seen many questions that specifically ask for the data rate, but I have seen questions that they ask about the compatibility and interoperability. So if I were you and studying for CCNA or CCNP exams, out of this table, I would learn the different standard categories, what radio frequencies associated with that and the interoperability among them. Because those are most common questions that I have seen in CCNA and CCNP exams. You can post this video here or take a screenshot of this diagram, this, uh, this table, because this is an important table for uh, your su uh, you know, successful grades in your exams and quizzes. So let's talk about radio frequencies. All wireless devices operate in the range of electromagnetic spectrum. WLAN networks operate in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. So the 2.4 is a UHF band that is on 802.11 BGN and AX. 5 gigahertz uh, band is a SHF version and it has 802.11 AN, AC and X, um, you know, um, differences, categories. Remember from the previous slide, uh, the different categories of IEEE standards. So those are the standards associated with each of this range. And on the bottom of the screen, we have this diagram that's showing radio waves, infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. And the wireless devices operates uh, within the frequencies of radio wave all the way to around infrared, like the end of the infrared spectrum. And uh, you can see the radio waves uh, being used for things like, you know, the FM AM radios, for example, TVs, um, you know, wireless, uh, sorry, but did like the rabbit ear TVs, as well as satellite systems. They all use the radio, you know, wireless technologies up here. As you move to forward uh, on the right, on the right towards this diagram, uh, you uh, the, you see the vis visible light spectrum. It is a very small sector. And then we have the, other part, we, uh, we have X-rays and gamma rays. So as you can see, the radio waves that we use for communication, including 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, bands, we don't actually see them. They are invisible to our eyes. Wireless standards organizations. So standards ensure interoperability between devices that are made by different manufacturers. So if you have Cisco making a wireless device, and a Linksys making another device and a D-Link making another device, they all can communicate with each other because there is that international standards that we follow. So you could have an Intel wireless network card on your computer or your laptop and you can have a Cisco wireless router or access point and you sh should be able to connect to uh, them each other and for communication purposes because we have these standards. So internationally, there are three organizations that make these standards. They are ITU, which is the International Telecommunication Union that regulates the allocation of radio spectrum and satellite orbits. IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers which specify how a radio frequency is modulated to carry information. They maintain the standard for local and metropolitan area networks, MAN, also known as MANs, with the IEEE 802 landman family of standards. The other one is called the Wi-Fi Alliance, which promotes the growth and acceptance of WLANs, and it is an association of vendors who objective is to improve the interoperability of products that are based on the 802.11 standard. So the Wi-Fi Alliance work with the vendors such as Cisco and Linksys and uh, uh, D-Link and they make sure that you know there, there is interoperability between their devices. Let's look at WLAN components. There's a video 
from Cisco called WLAN Components, which is available on your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. But if you do not have access to this video, I will post a link in the description of this video and it is available on my YouTube channel. And this WLAN components, they go over uh, antennas, wireless routers, internet ports and wireless access points and uh, autonomous and controller based access points. Uh, and it's a pretty good video that give a basic fundamental idea about how wireless systems works and you should go ahead and watch that. Wireless Network Interface Cards or Wireless NICs To communicate wirelessly, laptops, tablets, smartphones and even the latest automobiles include integrated wireless network interface cards that incorporate a radio transmitter or receiver. So your laptops, your smartphones, even Tesla cars for example nowadays comes with the network interface card as that can communicate wirelessly. If a device does not have an integrated wireless network interface card, then a USB wireless adapter can be used. So nowadays, most laptops will come with built-in wireless interface cards, but there are situations where if you have a desktop, for example, without a wireless interface card, uh, you can add that with a USB adapter that's shown here, for example. Wireless home router. A home user typically interconnects wireless devices using a small wireless router. Wireless router serves as the following access point, switch and router. So the wireless routers that you may have received from your ISP, internet service provider, they would look like similar something like this. And that device, the wireless router, actually have three different devices combined into one. It is acting like an access point because it provides wire, uh, wires uh, access. It provides the switching capabilities. So to interconnect those wire devices, also wireless devices, it allow uh, the switching of those packet switching in, inside that device. It also acts as a router because to provide a default gateway to other networks and the internet, it also has to act like a router. So the wireless routers that you have at your home provided by your ISP have three functions built into it. Access point, switch and router. So what is a wireless access point? Wireless clients use their wireless network interface card to discover nearby access points or APs. Clients then attempts to associate and authenticate with that access point. After being authenticated, the wireless users have access to the resources. So the main point of a access point is to allow the users to connect to the wireless network. As the name suggests, access point so the wireless access points is allowing, those points are allowing, those devices allowing your users to connect to your network. So in corporate environments and business environment, we don't have typically uh, these type of wireless routers. Instead we will have a separate router, we have separate switches, and then we will use uh, wireless access points such as these ones throughout the building providing coverage uh, in corporate environment. So instead of like a home router uh, switch um, and wireless access point built into one, now we have those components separately because it's easy to manage and it allow the scalability for your enterprise environment. So if you walk around a corporate building, you will see these access points uh, either on the walls or uh, on the ceilings that being mounted. And I will go over how those mounting and decisions are made, where to mount them in a separate lecture series on a separate course. Um, but for now, know that you know the, the primary uh, purpose of the access point to allow wireless network interface card to discover the network. So there are a few um, access point categories that you should be aware of. Uh, there are two types actually, one called autonomous, the other one is a controller base. So autonomous APs are standalone devices configured through a command line interface or a GUI, similar to our Cisco CLI. Each autonomous AP acts independently of others and is configured and managed manually by the administrator. So in other words, each 
device so each um, uh, wireless access point have its own configuration built into it controller based APs also known as lightweight APs or LAPs they use lightweight access control protocol also known as LWAPP to communicate with the LWAN controller or also known as WLC and each lap is automatically configured and managed by the WLC so how this work is basically we have a WLC that has all the information required to run this controller so to have that AP uh, running and AP is using all the uh, you know configurations from this WLC to manage that wireless network the advantage of using a controller based APs compared to using the autonomous APs is that you have a central management of your wireless system so you can have multiple controller based APs um, controlled by a single WLC so you have more uh, control over all those devices while this one you still do have the control but each AP has to be configured individually which is can be annoying if you have a lot of uh, wireless APs uh, across your network wireless antennas so there are a couple of different types of wireless antennas so there are three different types of antennas here uh, that we're going to discuss one called the omnidirectional antennas the other one is a directional antenna the other one called multiple input multiple output or MIMO antennas the omnidirectional antennas provide 360 degree coverage and it is ideal in houses and offices so most of your routers and if you have a a, uh, a router mod, uh, modem uh, combination uh, provided by your uh, ISP those antennas are almost always omnidirectional I have rarely seen I actually never seen a ISP provided uh, modem router uh, combination even for businesses without omnidirectional antennas they are more always almost omnidirectional antennas directional antennas which is a type of antennas that are used to focus the radio signal in a specific direction the most common example uh, of uh, uh, unidirectional uh, I'm sorry uh, directional antenna is the Yagi uh, and the parabolic dish those are the two common type the other one is called multiple input multiple output or MIMO antennas this uses multiple antennas up to eight to increase the bandwidth so you can have a multiple antennas put into this one single unit so you have one two three four antennas and it used the MIMO technology and it can increase the bandwidth of the signal that uh, going across the system again I'm not going to mention this over and over I will do a separate wireless lecture series later on my YouTube channel but for now only thing you need to know is remember there are three types of antennas omnidirectional directional and multiple input multiple output and what are the differences between these three antennas and how they are being deployed are the three key components that you should remember so omnidirectional mostly office home environment directional antennas uh, these are parabolic and uh, you know this type of antenna they are used maybe between different buildings so if you have a large campus such as university of calgary or set and where we have uh, buildings uh, across uh, different areas you can use these uni di sorry directional antennas to send those wireless signal between buildings and MIMO also can be used for the same purpose so you should know roughly how these are used uh, so the use case scenarios for your exams and quizzes for in this class but you don't need to know any more than that because that would be a separate course that I will be uh, teaching uh, on my YouTube channel later sometime WLAN operation so again there is a video called WLAN operation it is available on your Cisco NetAcad as well as maybe through your academic institution if you do not have access to those videos I will post a link to this video in the description of uh, this one and I will also leave a uh, card on the top right hand corner you can click on it uh, to watch that video 
So I would recommend you go ahead and watch this video before you move forward in this lecture. The 802.11 wireless topology modes. So there are a couple of uh, items that you should uh, know about the 802.11 wireless uh, topology modes because they change the way that how the network behave. So we have the ad hoc mode, infrastructure mode, and tethering mode. You're probably familiar with the tethering mode because of the mobile devices that we use day to day. And a lot of uh, you know, the service providers discuss about uh, tethering mode, uh, but you probably have not heard about ad hoc mode and infrastructure mode unless you are a network technician or you're into technologies. So ad hoc mode is used to connect clients in peer-to-peer -peer manner without an AP. So it's a very simple network. You have two uh, wireless capable devices and they're directly connected to each other. That's gonna create an ad hoc mode. The infrastructure mode, which is the most common type that we use today, is used to connect clients to a network using an access point. So your home router modem switch with the wireless capabilities, it is actually using the infrastructure mode. In fact, if you go into your wireless router or the modem and you log in and you will see uh, their term infrastructure mode somewhere in your settings. So that is the mode that is used by small businesses, businesses, uh, large campuses also, uh, and also at home for connecting uh, clients through APs. The other mode is called the tethering mode, which is a variation of the ad hoc topology and is used when a smartphone or a tablet with a cellular data access is unable to create a personal hotspot. So when you use your cell phone to create a personal hotspot in a remote area, for example, without any network access, but you do have the cell phone data access and you connect your, your uh, devices such as your laptop to your cell phone, that is called the tethering mode. So that's where the term tethering come from in your cell phone settings, for example. BSS and ESS, which are basic service set and extended service set. So the infrastructure mode uh, has two topological blocks. They are known as the basic service set or BSS, which uses single AP to interconnect all associated wireless clients and clients in different BSSs cannot communicate with each other. So if you have a BSS system, you have a BSS ID associated with one and that cannot be communicated across the BSS ID that you have on the other system. The extended service set, also known as ESS, is a union of two or more BSSs interconnected by a wireless distribution system. Clients in each BSS can now communicate through the ESS. So the ESS is basically, you can look at as a similar to like a wide area network, but what it's doing is it is interconnecting these BSS uh, systems together in a one single network environment. So these are key terms that you should know and the differences you should know. So we don't, you, we don't go into depth of this right now, but for now just know there are two types of infrastructure mode, BSS and ESS, and how they are differ from each other. 802.11 frame structure. So the 802.11 frame format is similar to the ethernet frame format, except that it contains more fields. So similar to the uh, 80, uh, you know, the, the, the regular Ethernet frames, the 802.11 uh, wireless standards uh, frames have the header, payload, and FCS. But in the header, we have frame control, we have the duration, we have the addresses, and we have sequence control, and we have the address number four here. So those are the differences in how 802.11 frame format compared to the others. In this class, for this module, only thing you need to learn is that what the 802.11 frame look like. You don't need to know what these addresses are in detail 
we already cover FCS in our previous lectures and previous lecture series. We already learned about the payload and etc. Just know that the 802.11 frame format is similar to the Ethernet frame format except it contains extra fields. That's all you need to know for this particular course for now. Uh, but however, Cisco and your instructor may assume that you have already know uh, how frame fields work from your previous lectures such as the introduction to networks lecture series course. Uh, so if you are not familiar with how frames work, I would recommend that you go back to my YouTube channel and watch those lectures uh, before you take the quiz for this uh, module, okay? So for now, just for this module, just remember that the 802.11 frame format is similar, but has more fields contained within them compared to the ethernet frame. CSMA slash CA. So the wireless are half duplex. That means only one client can hear while uh, the other cl client is sending data and they can hear, so he, they can't listen and send at the same time. So in other words, the half duplex system, a client cannot hear while it is sending, making it impossible to detect collision because collision detection requires a two-way communication, full duplex communication, which we do use in, uh, you know, network con LAN connections, right? So WLANs use carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, which is known as CSA MA slash CA to determine how and when to send data. A wireless client go through the following process in order to you know, implement that CSA MA slash CA standard. So what it does is it listens to the channel to see if it is idle. In other words, if there are any other traffic currently on that channel, it sends a ready to send, also known as RTS message to the AP access point to request dedicated access to the network. Re then the re it receives a clear send that in other words, CTS message from the access point granting access to send data. It waits a random amount of time before restarting this process if there is no CTS message is received. So in here, if the CTS message is received, it is good to go. But if it doesn't receive that, it's gonna send another send uh, you know, it is send another ready to send or RTS message, but after a random uh, amount of time um, elapse between the the, other, the first message that has been sent. So basically send the RTS, wait for AP to come back with the CTS. And if it doesn't hear back from us AP, it's gonna wait for a random amount of time and send another RTS requesting the same uh, from uh, AP. Then once it has established that, uh, you know, there is a clear to send a CTS message, uh, it will transmit the data. Acknowledges all transmission. So in this uh, CSA MA slash CA, it acknowledges all transmissions. So if a wireless client does not receive an acknowledgement, it assume a collision occurred and restart the process. So in this process, what happened is that if it doesn't hear back from the AP or, or there is a problem with the transmission, if it didn't hear back from AP or the AP didn't hear back from the uh, device, it basically assumes there is a collision has occurred and it restart the process. You should know how the CSA may work and uh, you should know these steps for your exams and quizzes. Wireless client and access point association. For wireless devices to communicate over a network, they must first associate it with an AP or wireless router because wireless router would have the AP capabilities, right? So the wireless devices complete the following three stage process. Discover a wireless AP, authenticate with the wireless AP and associate it with the wireless AP. So these are three components of how the wireless devices connect to a network. So what you need to understand here is that the wireless devices need to complete those three processes in order for it to have 
that communication channel between your the wireless network and the device. To achieve a successful association, a wireless client and an AP must agree on specific parameters. They include the SSID, password, network mode, security mode, and channel settings. So the SSID is the basically the name of your network. So the client needs to know the name of the network which he's trying to connect. So if you are connected to a wireless device right now, uh, such as a, your laptop, uh, you're communicating through a laptop or you're communicating through a, another Wi-Fi wi device such as an iPad or a Samsung pad, for example. It, it is now connected to a wireless network through an SSID, most likely. So how that works is basically, uh, if you have a home network, for example, you can configure your SSID to whatever you like, right? So that SSID is not only a human readable uh, ID that uh, can be easily uh, exchanged between humans. So if somebody come to your house and say, hey, I want to connect to your wireless network. So you're gonna say, my wireless network is this, and this is the password, right? The term you use, like say, hey, my wireless is network is, let's say, Sanuja Net or Sanuja Home System or something like that. That that broadcasted, uh, you know, the the network information is that SSID. So that's how humans and the network identify your home network. The name of your wireless network is the SSID. Password is the password that required to authenticate through uh, onto that SSID. Network mode, which is the 802.11 standard in use. So remember those standard B, N, G standards. So if you have a friend who only has a device that run on B standard, but your network only has N standard, your friend won't be able to connect to the network. The standard has to be compatible between your friend's device and your home wireless network. So that's what I mean by the network mode. Security mode, which is the security parameter setting with, which include web, uh, WPA and WPA2. Again, I will go into detail of those uh, uh, ones uh, later. But for now, remember the security mode is important as well as also channel settings. So the channel setting is the, the frequency bands in use. So that could be five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. Those are some examples of channel settings. So in order for your friend who just came to your house to connect to the, your home wireless network, you have to make sure all of these items are met and all of these items are satisfied. So there will be a successful association between your friend's device and your home wireless network. Otherwise you won't be able to connect to the system, right? So that's what we are trying to get here. So there are two modes. Uh, so they are called the passive and active discover mode. So those are two different types of uh, discovery modes. Wireless client connect to the AP using a passive or active scanning process. So the active scanning process is also known as the probing process. So the in passive mode, AP or the access point openly advertise its services by periodically sending broadcast beacon frames containing the SSID, the supported standards and security settings. So it includes the SSID, supported standard and the security settings. So it's basically sending out a beacon out. So in, in passive mode, what's gonna happen is you have that access uh, point and it's sending the beacon with the SSID supported standard and security setting. And every couple of um, uh, seconds, to, you know, every time it keeps sending that information. So a wireless client, let's say your laptop, would be able to see that network information. So most homes, for example, if you have especially a, a router modem uh, combination provided to you by your service provider is set up under passive mode, where it's openly advertising the network or your wireless network name. So if you go to your cell phone or a networking device and you try to connect to a Wi-Fi network and if you see the name of your home wireless network, that means it is actually passive mode. So this is the most commonly used mode. The other one called active mode, where the wireless clients must know the name of the SSID. So the 
SSID is not broadcasted in the area. So it is not broadcasted by the access point. So the wireless clients has to know what SSID to enter. The wireless clients initiate the process by broadcasting a probe request frame on multiple channels. So in this case, you have the active mode enabled. So you have a wireless device. So if they go to the wireless setting, it's not gonna see the SSID. It's not gonna see the wireless network. But because we know the wireless network exists, so the client can enter the SSID on this wireless device, this client device, and it can connect to that wireless network because the, the, the client is aware of the SSID. So those are the two different things called passive mode and active mode. One thing I like to highlight here, I know for a fact some retailers and some IT professionals even give consumers who have very little idea about how wireless networks works that the active mode is more secure than passive mode. It is kind of true, but it is not true. Active versus passive mode is not a security feature. This may show up on your exams or your instructor during a lab exam could ask you this question. There is a misconception even among IT professionals that active mode is more secure than the passive mode, which is not true. Active and passive modes are simply two modes of discovery. It is not a security feature. Just hiding the SSID doesn't mean your network is now secure from hackers. There is and there are multiple ways a hacker or a bad actor can obtain your SSID even when you are in active mode. So please, please, please do not tell your consumers or your end users as an IT professional that the use of active mode is a type of security. It is not a type of security. It may make it a little bit harder for a regular Joe down the street to figure out your wireless network, but it does not in any way secure your network. So if you have the same security setup on the passive mode and you have the same security setup on the active mode, there's no way that the active mode is more secure than the passive mode. So remember that this is a huge misconception. I have gone to uh, different companies in, uh, in Canada where they sell uh, wireless devices such as access points and wireless routers. And when I go and try to buy an item, they ask like, uh, hey, do you, uh, we have this package. We will set up your wireless router. Obviously, I, I'm not going to buy that. But if I buy that, they're going to tell you uh, to try to upsell you by saying that we will make sure that your SSID is hidden from hackers. But what they're basically doing is they're putting your device into active mode. And no, it is not a secure mode. Majority of threat actors or hackers know how to get, obtain your SSID even when the SSID is hidden. So do not, you know, have them mean you know, this misinformation uh, you know, spread out across the world by as IT professional that the active mode is a type of security. It is not a type of security, it's just a two different types of discover modes, okay? So active mode is not a type of security. CapWap operation. Again, there is a video called CapWap which is available through your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. If you do not have access to this video, I will leave a link in the description so you can go ahead and watch it. As well as I will leave a card on the top right hand corner of this video so you can click on it and watch it. I would recommend that you watch these videos so you have a better understanding of concepts that we are covering. Introduction to CapWap. CapWap is a IEEE standard protocol that enables a WLC to manage multiple APs and WLANs. Remember previously I mentioned one of the advantages of having a WLC, you can manage multiple access points. So CapWap is an international standard designated by IEEE as opposed to a proprietary standards done used by organizations such as Cisco 
that allow us to manage multiple APs connected to a WLC. CAPWAP is based on LWAPP, but it adds additional security with datagram or datagram transport layer security, also known as DLTS. CAPWAP enables us to encapsulate and forward WLAN client traffic between access point and a WLC over tunnels using UDP ports 5246 and 5247. CAPWAP operates both IPv4 and IPv6 uh, systems and in IPv4 the, it uses the IP uh, protocol 17 and in IPv6 it uses the IP protocol 136. So in this class, you should know that the CAPWAP is based on the LWAPP and it uses the additional datagram transport layer security also known as DLTS. You should know CAPWAP is a IEEE standard and you should also know the port 5246 and 5247 are used in communication between AP and the WLC over those CAPWAP tunnels. And IPv4 uses IP protocol 17 and IPv6 uses IP protocol 136. Those are key things you should know about CAPWAPs. Um, and I will go into much more detail in a separate wireless lecture series on how CAPWAP works. Uh, but in this lecture, on our next few slides, uh, we will look into some basic overview of how CAPWAP works. Uh, you don't need to know any more than what we cover here. So in CAPWAP operation, uh, we have something also called the split MAC architecture. So what it does, uh, so basically the CAPWAP split the MAC concept um, and does all the function normally performed by individual APs and uh, it distributes them between two functional components and they are AP MAC functions and WLC MAC functions because CAPWAC is used between communication uh, of those two devices, AP and WLCs, right? So how the CAPWAC split uh, MAC architecture works is uh, shown in this summary on the right hand side, this um, table. So we have the AP MAC functions, which is a beacon and probe responses. It allows packet acknowledgement and retransmission. It has frame uh, queuing and packet prioritization, and it allows MAC layer data encryption and decryption. WLC MAC functions, which is the other split side of that, is it allows authentication, association and reassociation of roaming clients frame translation to other protocols, and it allows termination of 802.11 traffic on a wired interface. So these are like two types of architecture in the, uh, you know, two types of, you know, split uh, in the split MAC architecture. So that's something you should know. DTLS encryption. So the DTLS provides security between the access point and the WLC. It is enabled by default to secure the CAPWAP control tunnel and encrypt all management and control traffic between access point and WLC. Data encryption is disabled by default and requires a DTLS license to be installed on the WLC before it can be enabled on the AP. So that's a key piece of information you should remember when you're deploying systems. So the data encryption or data encryption is disabled by default and required a DTLS license to be installed on the WLC before it can be enabled on the AP even though uh, it is enabled by default to secure the uh, w, uh, sorry, CAPWAP control tunnels and encrypt all management and control traffic between AP and WLC, you have to make sure that you have those licenses installed, otherwise your CAPWAP tunnel not gonna work either. So that's what's shown here on the right hand side. You have an access point, you have a WLC, and they are communicating through CAPWAP control tunnels and they are using DTLS encryption, which is enabled by default in the CAPWAP control. But on the CAPWAP data, the DTL 
as encryption is disabled by default, that needs to be enabled uh, manually after installing the encryption uh, license keys. Flex Connect APs. So in CapPack operation, the Flex Connect enable the configuration and control of APs over W, uh, sorry, over a WAN link. There are two methods of option for Flex Connect APs. One called connected mode, the other one called standalone mode. In the connected mode, the WLC is reachable. The Flex Connect AP has CapWAC connectivity with the WLC through the CapWAC tunnel. The WLC performs all CapWAC functions. Standalone mode, the WLC is unreachable. The Flex Connect AP has lost CapWAC connectivity with the WLC. The Flex Connect AP can assume some of the WLC functions such as switching client data traffic locally and perform client authentication locally. So those are key differences. So the connected mode, the WLC is reachable. The Flex Connect AP has the AP, sorry, uh, CapWAC connectivity with the WLC through the CapWAC tunnel and the WLC will be performing all the CapWAC functions. However, in the standalone mode, just like it says standalone, the meaning of standalone in English, basically what's going to happen is the Flex uh, Connect AP would be a standalone device that assumes some of the function of WLC functions. And uh, uh, that includes things like switching data uh, traffic locally and perform client authentication locally. So in here uh, on this diagram, it shows the, a corporate office. Uh, and a branch office and you have a CapWAP connected with a Flex Connect on one side. And uh, that's what the, you know, the, the these different Flex Connect mode would do in this uh, network. Channel management. Frequency channel saturation. If the demand for a specific wireless channel is too high, the channel may become oversaturated, degrading the quality of the communication. Channel saturation can be mitigated using techniques that use the channel more efficiently. They include direct sequence spread spectrum, which is a modulation technique designed to spread a signal over a larger frequency band used by 802.11b devices to avoid interference from other devices using the same 2.4 gigahertz frequency, such as microwaves. Frequency hopping spread spectrum, which is a system where transmit radio signals by rapidly switching a carrier signal among many frequency channels. Sender and the receiver must be synchronized to know which channels to jump to, and it is used by original 802.11 standard. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is a subset of frequency division multiplexing in which a single channel uses multiple subchannels on adjacent frequencies. OFDM is used by number of communication systems, including 802.11 AGN and AC standards. Again, the depth of these technologies, like I will go into much more detail into these technologies in a separate lecture series on wireless systems. But for this module, for this lecture series, just know these types exist and how they are differ from each other. Channel selection. The 2.4 gigahertz band is subdivided into multiple channels, each allocated with 22 megahertz bandwidth and separated from next channel by five megahertz. The best practice for 802.11 BGN WLANs requiring multiple APs is to use non-overlapping channels such as one, six, and 11. So for this class, you basically need to know that you should use non-overlapping channels. You don't necessarily need to know uh, the specific channels such as 1, 6, and 11 would not overlap. Also, if you look at 2, 7, 
for example, you know, and uh, seven overlaps with 10, but you can use like 12 or something like that, 13 over here. So in this example, we are using one, six and 11, uh, but you can use, you know, different channels that uh, would not overlap against each other. For our advanced classes on wireless, you should know uh, which channels to pick on an exam. But for now, you just need to make sure that you know that the WLANs uh, should use non-overlapping channels uh, so that it would be a much better performance. Uh, you will get much better performance on your network. So for five gigahertz uh, standards, 802.11 ANAC, there are 24 channels. Each channel is separated from the next channel by 20 megahertz. So five gigahertz channels look like this. And they are non-overlapping channels uh, include uh, 36, 48, and 60. So 36, 48, and 60. If you look at it, see 36 doesn't overlap with 48, doesn't overlap with 60. Again, you should know roughly you know where the, how this works but not in depth to the point that we're going to cover in our different lecture series on wireless for this class you should know that the five gigahertz standards uh, have these non-overlapping channels so how do you plan a uh, wlan deployment so the number of users supported by a wlan depends on the following the geographical layout of the facility, the number of bodies and devices that can fit in a space, such as if you have a large arena or like a hockey place, you know, <laughs> you will have thousands of people trying to access the public wireless network, as opposed to a small office, the wireless network access, uh, it would be very limited, right? So that's what it means by number of bodies and devices. The data rates uh, users expect. So if you have an office, with uh, critical data that need to have a higher data rate to access, as opposed to a hockey arena uh, that may need uh, lower data rates, for example. The use of non-overlapping channels by multiple APs and transmitting power. So that's another thing that you should be uh, looking at when you are designing these things. So if you have a wireless access point in the middle of here, right here, you can increase the transmit power so that you have get more coverage, uh, but, uh, you also need to look at distributing your users across multiple access points instead of just increasing the power of this maybe you can put multiple access point with low uh, lower transmission uh, power but now the users will be bouncing off of all of these access point hence basically you are creating a load balancing with the access points right so that's another thing you should be looking at so when planning the location of APs, the approximate circular coverage area is important. And we will go into depth of this again in my wireless lecture series, because it is not just putting, you know, these devices based on this circular area, because based on the type of walls structures you have and other structures and devices you have, it is not always a, this nice circle, right? So again, I will go into depth in a different lecture series, but for now, you just need to remember these four basic concepts in uh, deployment of WLAN. So you don't need to know any more detail than that. Again, it is much more complex than this, but for now, that's all you need to know for all your exams and quizzes. WLAN threats or wireless LAN threats. Again, there is a video called WLAN threats available on your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. If you do not have access to a copy of that video, I will post it on my YouTube channel. I will leave a link in the description as well as a card on the top right hand corner of this video so you can go ahead and click and watch it. Wireless security overview. A WLAN is open to anyone within range of an AP and the appropriate credentials to associate it. Attacks can be generated by outsiders, disgruntled employees, and even unintentionally by employees. For example, an employee or uh, uh, your friend who is connected to your home network download a bad program that may be used by a threat actor outside even your network to attack your wireless system. 
wireless networks are specifically susceptible to several threats including interception of data, wireless intruders, DOS attacks, and rogue APs. So let's look at DOS attacks or denial of service attacks. The wireless DOS attacks can be the result of uh, improperly configured devices, a malicious user intentionally interfering with the wireless communication, or accidental interference. To minimize the risk of DOS attack due to improperly configured devices and malicious attacks, harden all devices, keep passwords secure, create backups, and ensure that all configuration changes are incorporated in during off hours. So that those are some of the key things that you can take. This is like basically the broad overview. This is a very high level overview of how you can mitigate a DOS attack. So in this course, again, I'm not gonna go into depth of each one of these, but this is how the you know broad overview of the uh, you know mitigation of DOS attacks. One thing I should mention uh, about uh, this slide is that some of the examples of uh, such things because these slides said do not talk about those examples, but I think it add value to our lecture. So for in improperly configured devices, for example, uh, I seen even co in corporate environment, people leave the default uh, password for some of the Wi-Fi networks as admin, which is bad. Uh, so that would be used by a threat actor to gain access to your network or default password for a management network. That's an, an example of a improperly configured devices. A malicious user intentionally interfering with the wireless communication would include someone bringing in a some kind of a device that will uh, jam your wireless signals that would get, uh, result in a denial of service for your legitimate users, or uh, someone uh, intentionally increasing a uh, strength of a, a signal, a wireless signal of some kind of a device they have, hence interfering with your network. So it could be a malicious signal, or it could be a malicious uh, regular, any 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz system that is not necessarily malicious itself if they use it for the correct purpose, but by increasing the signal strength and interfering with your network that could create a DOS attack. Accidental interference, the best example, as I mentioned, is one of your friends downloading a application that would create a wireless interference. Or here's another good one that happened a lot is a microwave. A lot of office, uh, uh, you know, lunch rooms have microwaves to heat up food. Those microwaves, if it is, if it is in the same range and the same channels as the your wireless devices or your wireless access point or your microwave is really close to your wireless access point that could create a denial of service for your legitimate users. So those are examples of uh, these items. Next, we're gonna look at uh, rogue access points. A rogue access point is an AP or wireless router that has been connected to a corporate network without explicit authorization and against corporate policy. So basically, somebody who has access to a network closet, for example, can go ahead and plug in an AP uh, wire, like an Ethernet cable, and then you know have a AP set up on your network without your corporation knowing about it. So once connected, the rogue AP can be used by an attacker to capture MAC addresses, capture data packets, gain access to the network resources, or launch a man-in-the-middle attack. A personal network hotspot could also be used as a rogue AP. For example, a user with a secure network access enables their authorized Windows host to become a Wi-Fi access point, hence allowing other people who are not authorized to access your authorized network now have a pathway to your network. So to prevent the installation of rogue APs, organizations must configure WLCs with rogue AP policies and use monitoring software to actively monitor the radio spectrum and unauthorized APs. So that's the best way to mitigate it. But here's another one that is not discussed on 
in this slide is to educate your employees. So if you have a bunch of employees with personal uh, uh, devices that maybe turn into personal network hotspots uh, with the secure access still enabled on your network, uh, so I would educate your employees about the dangers of that and maybe have written policies of if they do this, what could be the uh, result of it. You know, you they get laid off or fired from the job or they will get demoted or something like that. There should be proper policies. If you are working for a proper IT company or proper company, they should have policies in place um, in terms of actions that can be taken if an employee use, uh, you know, a hotspot on their company devices. So that's another th piece of information that you can use, one other piece of method that you can use to prevent rogue access points. Man in the middle attack. Uh, man in the middle attack is a very famous type of attack. It's also known as MITM. Uh, you probably seen on the news uh, and elsewhere as well. And how it works is the hacker is positioned in between two legitimate entities in order to read or modify the data that passes between the two parties. A popular wireless MITM attack is called the Evil Twin AP attack, where an attacker introduces a rogue access point and configure it with the same SSID as the legitimate AP. Defeating an MITM attack begins with identifying legitimate devices on the WLAN. To do this, users must be authenticated. After all the legitimate devices are known, the network can be monitored for abnormal devices or traffic. So again, I will not go into the depth of how evil twin AP attack works for this course. Only thing you need to know is how uh, MITM uh, attack, man in the middle attack in wireless networks work uh, is that a threat actor positioned between uh, the end device or your wireless device and the access point or your net uh, wireless uh, you know point, right? So where the attacker then can use uh, that rogue access point that is being introduced between you and the legitimate access point uh, and get your data and access the data that being transmitted between you and the legitimate access point. So that's all you need to know here. But again, I will go into depth of how this works in our wireless lecture series. Let's look at how you can secure wireless LANs. There's a video called Secure WLANs that is available through your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. Again, if you do not have access to these videos, I will leave a link in the description for a copy of this video, as well as I will leave a card on the top right hand corner of this so you can go ahead and click and watch it. And this video is available on my YouTube channel, but you should also have an access to this through your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. SSID clocking and MAC address filtering. To address the threat of keeping wireless intruders out and protecting data, two early security features were used and are still available on most routers and access points. They are SSID clocking and MAC address filtering. In SSID clocking, APs and some wireless routers allow the SSID beacon frame to be disabled. Wireless clients must manually configure with SSID to connect to the network. However, in my opinion, this is nowadays in, in 2022 is not a very good option because just because of you clock, you know, hide your uh, SSID doesn't mean with modern hacking technologies that a threat actor cannot figure out the SSID. It will take less than five minutes for me to figure out your SSID, even with your SSID clocking is enabled. So that is not the best option. But MAC address filtering 
which in that case, an administrator can manually permit or deny clients wireless access based on their physical MAC address, hard, hard uh, MAC, uh, MAC hardware address. Uh, that is actually better than, in my opinion, SSID clocking. So unfortunately, I don't have the figure, but there is a figure from uh, Cisco, if you have access to Cisco textbooks, uh, in that figure, the router is configured to permit two MAC addresses. So the devices with different MAC addresses will not be able to join the 2.4 gigahertz WLAN. So basically, that, you, what you, what you're happy, what's happening here is that if you have a small office wireless network and you don't allow everybody to connect to the system wirelessly, but only certain uh, office devices, such as let's say a wireless printer needs to connect to that access point, you can use a MAC address filtering because there is no need for multiple other devices to connect to that access point. So you can basically use the MAC address filtering, which is much more secure than uh, SSID clogging. 802.11 original authentication methods. The best way to secure a wireless network is to use authentication and encryption systems. Two types of authentications were introduced with the original 802.11 standards. They include the open system authentication and shared key authentication. In the open system authentication, no password required, typically used to provide free internet access in public areas such as cafes, airports, and hotels. Client is responsible for providing security such as through a VPN. So in other words, the data is transmitting in a public network. There is no security associated with it. Anybody can connect to it. It's an open network. However, that means uh, a threat actor can also be in the same network uh, snooping your packet and data. And that may not be good for you know accessing like, for example, banking information, for example. The other option is share key authentication. This provides mechanisms uh, such as WEP, WPA, WPA2, and WPA3 to authenticate and encrypt data between wireless client and access point. So in here, we have encryption enabled because we are using the shared key authentication. However, the password must be pre-shared between both parties in order for you to connect. So nowadays in 2022, most of the authentication systems in most small offices as well as uh, cafes and even small hotels would be share key authentication. So when you go to the reception desk, they will give you the name of their SSID and um, the uh, the uh, shared key that you need uh, to you enter for the password in order to connect that. So most networks will have that. But a note of caution here, just because of you use a shared key authentication, do not think that your data is highly secured because of the encryption is there. The reason for that is, as a network administrator of a hotel, I have the ability, and I have the ability to maybe snoop your packets. So never trust a public network. <laughs> you know, even if it is technically authenticated because there are other ways to maybe snoop your packets and information. So if you're in a hotel room and you got a uh, SSID name and you have a password, don't automatically assume you can put your guard down because you know it doesn't necessarily mean there may be a network administrator or system administrator snooping your data for um, you know bad purposes. So be careful with that. So in that situation, I would say even with the shared authentication, maybe a VPN may be safe, but I will talk about the issues with uh, VPN providers, you know, especially you see on those YouTube channels with advertisement for VPN. They're not as secure as you think. Again, I will explain that in a later. For now, just remember open system authentication has no security at all. Shared key authentication has some security that provide authentication and encryption through shared uh, password associated with the SSID. However, when you go to a hotel in a random remote location in Canada, I would not trust even with the shared authentication because there may be some ways. There are actually ways for network administrators within the organizations to snoop your data. So be careful with that. But however, the shared key authentication is much more secure than the open system authentication. 
So there are a few uh, shared key authentication methods, which is providing our security for your WLAN. And uh, they include the WEP or WEP, WPA, WPA2 and WPA3. Uh, WEP or the Wired um, uh, Equivalent Privacy or WVP is the original 802.11 specification designed to secure the data using uh, reverse uh, cipher 4 or RC4 uh, encryption method with static key. WEP is no longer recommended and should never be used. So some routers and access point nowadays doesn't even have the option to enable WEP because it is not no 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 longer secured because people were able to a uh, bunch of engineers and students were able to prove that web is uh, hackable so they are no longer in use wi-fi protected access uh, there are three types of uh, wi-fi protected access it, they are wpa wpa2 and wpa3 it is developed by the Wi-Fi Alliance, and that is a standard that they develop uh, that secure the data with much stronger temporal key integra integrity protocol or TKIP encryption algorithm. And the DKIP changes the key for each packet, making it much more difficult to hack. The WPA2 uses the advanced encryption standard or AES, AES for encryption. And AES is currently considered is one of the strongest encryption protocols. The WPA3, this is the next generation of Wi-Fi security and all WPA3 enabled devices use the latest security methods, disallow outdated uh, legacy protocols and require the use of protected management frames, also known as PMF. So if you are different, deploying a Wi-Fi network in a corporate or small office environment or even your home environment. If you have the option to use WPA3 on every single of your end devices as well as your network infrastructure, I would always pick the WPA3. So whenever you go out to the field with anything, not just wireless technologies, but even also LAN technologies, you should always try to use the latest technology, latest um, security technologies available at that time, unless there is an issue with backward compatibility. Because one of the problem with uh, WPA3 is you may have devices that can only take WPA and WPA2, but cannot accept uh, communication from WPA3. In that case, you may have to, you know, create a, a WPA2 or WPA network. Certainly do not use uh, WEP, WEP, because it is no longer secure. That is considered as a legacy uh, authentication method. Authenticating a home user. Home routers typically have two choices for authentication, WPA and WPA2. Uh, then uh, with WPA2 having two authentication methods. So WPA is the legacy one. Uh, if there any reason for use it because you have devices that can only can take WPA, go ahead, do that. But I would not use that. Uh, but WPA2 is the other option that you will find in most home uh, devices. So WPA2 has two authentication methods. They are a, a personal and the other one is enterprise. So the personal one is intended for home use or small office networks. Users authenticate using the pre-shared key or PSA. So that means you have wireless clients authenticate with the wireless router using that pre-shared password with no special authentication server required. So in other words, you have your SSID and you have a password associated with it, which is the PSK, which is a pre-shared key. So you're gonna give that SSID and the password to anybody who wants to have access to your uh, WPA and they can, uh, sorry, WPA2, and they can uh, access that through the WPA2 personal. The WPA2 enterprise, that is intended for enterprise networks and it requires a remote authentication dialing user service, also known as a radius server uh, in order for system to authenticate its users. 
The device must be authenticated by a RADIUS server and then users must authenticate using 802.1x standard which uses the extendable authentication protocol or EAP for authentication. So enterprise is a good option for a small office environment and even large um, uh, office environment. However, it would require that RADIUS server. Uh, I went over a little bit about how RADIUS servers work on my previous lectures, how those AAA servers also uh, uh, can be associated with those RADIUS servers. But for now, what you need to remember, a typical home user have the option of you, uh, setting it up their uh, network either through WPA2 personal or WPA2 enterprise. But in almost all cases in home users, they would use the WPA2 personal. And again, don't use WEP, W-E-P, uh, unless, you know, there's really need to use that, um, you know, W-E-P, you know, WEP, it's not very secure. Another note I need to point out here is that this uh, WPA personal and enterprise uh, standards are available on WPA1, uh, just WPA, uh, as well as WPA2. So both of them will support the personal and enterprise methods. Encryption methods. So WPA and WPA2 includes two encryption protocols, the Temporal Key Integrity Pro Protocol, also known as TKIP, which is used by WPA and provides support for legacy WLAN equipment. Uh, make use of WEP uh, or WEP, but encrypts the layer two payload using TKIP, right? So that's the, uh, the TK, uh, IP methods of uh, WPA. The other one is called Advanced Encryption Standard, also known as AES. That is used by WPA2 and uses the counter cipher mode with block chaining message authentication code protocol, also known as CCMP, that allows destination hosts to recognize if the encrypted and non-encrypted bits have been altered. So that is much better compared to DKIP. If you have the ability to deploy that in your entire network, I would pick the AES. Authentication in enterprise environment. So in enterprise security mode, uh, there are choices uh, you know, uh, that you need to make. That's one of the choice that you can make, the enterprise security mode, right? So. That include authentication, authorization, and accounting, AAA radius server, as I mentioned. And there are pieces of information that required for you to set up in order for that authentication web to enterprise to work. They include radius server IP address, which is the IP address of the server, UDP port numbers. So you need to make sure UDP ports 1812 for radius authentication, 1813 for 80 radius uh, accounting, but also uh, operates uh, UDP port uh, 1645 and 1646. So you need to figure those uh, uh, stuff up. Uh, you know, you need to s set it up and you can try to figure it out. If you are in a corporate environment that already has a radius server, you need to get those information. And finally, you just like uh, the the personal one, we need to have a shared key. So you're gonna use that shared key to authenticate the AP with the radius server. So we are not giving that shared key away to your end user. We use that shared key that is will be used to authenticate the access point with the radius server when you are setting up this access point. So on the right hand side, you see an example of a web to enterprise setup with the AES um, encryption with the radius server address 10, 10, 10, 100 with the share, uh, shared secret key. So the user authentication and authorization is handled by the 802.11x standard, which provides a centralized server-based authentication of end users. So this is advantageous to uh, use uh, in environment, this is advantageous to our network administrators in environments where multiple users in a small office or a business environment or in office environment because now you have a centralized control over authentication and it is easy to manage 
and easy to scale, right? As opposed to uh, everybody getting that pre-shared key in the personal WPA2, right? So that's why we use that. WPA3. Because WPA2 is no longer considered secure, just like the w, uh, the web, right? WPA3 is recommended when available. WPA3 includes four key features. So WPA3 personal uh, will, uh, you know, block any brute force attacks by using simultaneous authentication of equals, also known as SAE. WPA3 Enterprise uses 802.11x, uh, which is a EP, sorry, EAP uh, authentication. However, it requires the use of 192-bit cryptographic suit and eliminates the mixing of security protocols for previous 802.11 standards. The open networks does not use any authentication, however, uses opportunistic wireless encryption, also known as the W, sorry, OWE, to encrypt all wireless data traffic. IoT onboarding, which uses the device provisioning protocol, also known as DPP, to quickly onboard an IoT devices to your network. For this course, just remember these four features associated with WPA, but not any detail more than that, because that would be a separate course that I will be covering. And that would bring us to the end of this lecture. And now I will go over a summary of what we have covered. So what did I learn in this module? So what did we have, what we have covered in this module? We covered a wireless LANs, which are WLANs, are based on IEEE standards and that can be classified into four main types. They include WPAN, WLAN, WMAN, and WWAN. So we cover those things and how they are different from each other. VLAN wireless technology uses the unlicensed radio spectrum to send and receive data. Examples of this technology include Bluetooth, WiMAX, cellular broadbands and satellite broadband. One of the key term here is those signals are technically unlicensed radio spectrums, okay? WLAN networks operates in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band and five gigahertz band. The three organizations influencing WLAN standards are the ITU-R, the IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance. We also learn about CAPWAP, which is a IEEE standard protocol that enables a WLC to manage multiple APs and WLANs. We learn about DTLS, which is a protocol that provides security between APs and uh, WLC, basically by creating tunnels. Wireless LAN devices have transmitters and receivers turned to specific frequencies of radio waves to communicate. And we learned the ranges are then split into smaller ranges called channels. And we learn about DSS, FHSS, and OFDM. We cover 802.11 BGN standards that operates in 2.4 gigahertz um, to 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. And the 2.4 gigahertz band is subdivided into multiple channels and each channel is allocated 22 megahertz bandwidth and is separated from the next channel by five megahertz. We also learn wireless networks are susceptible to threats, including data interception, wireless intruders, DOS attacks, and rogue APs. We learn how we can keep wireless intruders out and protect uh, and the two early stages of security features are still available on, in most routers and APs. They are include SSID clocking and MAC address filtering. Again, I mentioned SSID clocking is not as secure as MAC address filtering. MAC address filtering is so much secure if you can use that over SSID clocking. We also learned there are four sh uh, shared key authentication techniques available that include WEP, WPA, WPA2, and WPA3. So that's a overall summary of what we have covered in this lecture. Again, I would like to highlight to you that we are just brushing the surface 
of wireless technologies and uh, security vulnerabilities and how we can mitigate those security issues. This is just a high level overview and I will go over in depth wireless technology in a separate lecture series that is not associated with this lecture series but for this lecture series this is all what you need to know about wireless technologies. If you like these type of lectures please make sure to thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the topics that we have covered today, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm more than happy to answer your questions or concerns with respect to any of the topics that we have covered. Until next time, have a nice day.